Oi oi people, Silky here, and you're listening to the Life Art Musician podcast. A podcast exploring the minds of creatives who have dedicated their lives to pursuing a career in music. The Life of Musician podcast is brought to you by Hookings Management, my artist services company that empowers our fellow DIY musicians to grow a monetized fan base without a record label. We offer a range of services such as online marketing, artist mentorship, release campaign management, videography, photography, graphic and website design, plus tons more useful services that are built to cater for independent musicians on small, self-funded budgets. Helping musicians market and monetize their art form is our passion. So if you're an artist that needs help taking your career to the next level, please feel free to reach out and get in touch via hookingsmanagement.com where you can book a video call with me for some free advice on your project. On today's episode, I'm buzzing to be joined by Samuel Preston. Sam has had an incredible career as both an artist and songwriter. His band, The Ordinary Boys, have scored four top 10 singles, three top 20 albums. They've toured extensively around the globe, played at huge festivals such as Glastonbury and Reading and Leeds, appeared on legendary TV shows, later with Jules Holland and Top of the Pops amongst many other impressive achievements. His writing career is just as successful. Sam co-wrote the number one hit by Ollie Murs, Heart Skips a Beat, and also has writing credits on songs for other major pop acts, such as Kylie Minogue, Enrique Iglesias, Cher, and Liam Payne. I'm sure that our listener base of DIY musicians are gonna benefit hugely from listening to Sam's experiences in navigating what has been a diverse, a long-standing music career. So without further ado, let's get into it. Sam Preston, Hello. welcome to the Life of Musician podcast, mate. Thanks for having me. So you've had huge success as both an artist and a songwriter. Uh, your career kicked off with this mad ride in The Ordinary Boys as part of the guitar music boom of the noughties. And then you went on to become a prolific writer for major pop acts. Uh, so let's start with the ordinary boys. You yeah. formed in Brighton in 2002, and by 2004, your debut album, Over the Counter Culture, was released on one of the genre's hottest labels, Be Unique. Um, I've said on this podcast before that big record deals for guitar bands are as rare as rocking hall shit these days. Yeah. But back then, they weren't. Um, there were some great opportunities out there for guitar bands. Um, so what do you remember about that period, about getting signed? Honestly, everyone, they were just given record, they like, were given anyone who had the right haircut would get a record label <laughs> at that time. And for us, it was all very, like, coincidental, I feel like. And I, I do feel like most of those bands were quite shit. It, uh, and that, and I think, f- probably for me, I mean, that's more about why I'm a writer now, but I think for me, it was like, I sort of accidentally found myself in music. Um, like the way we got our first tour, for instance, is like, is I'd gone to the Enemy Awards because we were in a band and they were like, oh, you know, people were sort of invited us there just cause to, to meet people, whatever. And then on the train on the way back, I was slagging off Pete Doherty because he was being, he was like reading poetry and just being like, like pretentious. And I was like, oh, fuck, that guy's be, this was such a fucking pretentious piece of shit. And then I hear from like the seat next to me, uh, that's my band, pal. And I'm like, oh, sorry, you know, like, your singer's a pit, like was pretentious, whatever. And it was Carl. I oh, really. And he was like, I was like, oh, I'm in a band. Can I send you my demo? And we did. And then they were, I literally gave him a cassette. It was in my bag. And then we like went on tour of the Libertines. Mad. So it's like all of it felt very like I didn't like if if the thing is like advice on how to get a record deal. I just don't think that even is a real. You know, that's not a real route for people anymore. It's totally changed, isn't yeah. it? So was someone, was there like A&R people at your gigs or whatever? Is that how you got discovered? Uh, I used to promote gigs in Brighton. Yeah. And um, I, some one of the guys I promoted gigs with was like, we should try and get some A&R, this to some A&Rs. And then it all very, it all happened very like, it felt like without even really trying, it all sort mm. of like just happened to us. Mm. And was uh, it quite a substantial advance as well that B Unique gave you? I don't really remember. I don't remember. But I feel like, have you seen that Oasis documentary? Yeah, Super Sonic. Yeah. You know where they they just it just all sort of happens around them. 
Yeah. And, but, and before you know it, they're like the biggest band in the world. Yeah, they like sign off the doll and then two years later... But like the way the, do- the documentary does that really well, where it's just like, you're a bit like, you sort of just, you just accept it. I just, you're just like, yeah. yeah, we're big now. I guess we're like in a band. But I think for me, I never wanted to do it for very long. Right. I always thought, well, see if I can get a couple of years out of this. Mm-hmm. And then wanted to have a proper job, really. Was that because you like... Um, in, in your mind, you saw it as something that wasn't sustainable long term. I did, and I think uh, like the touring the whole time, all of that's it's fucking hard. It's a hard life. I feel yeah. like maybe. I mean, you tell me, but like, it, yeah, is it it's not exhausting, like exhausting? Yeah. But you don't drink, right? No. So I feel like that is the, you. You have to not drink and do it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I'm like uh, quite a few years sober now, but I struggled with addiction and that, um, yeah, my early 20s. And it, yeah, I mean, it's the worst job really, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like for, in terms of like, um, yeah, it's such an enabling environment, isn't it? Do you know and what you I mean? can do what you want all day long, except for an hour a day when you're yeah. on tour. So like, and with this is why it's also so good what you do when you're like, because what I think what is so interesting about your career now is like so many people are like oh, i did music now i'm gonna do i'm gonna be a booking agent i'll be a manager yeah but you're like i'm gonna do music and that yeah exactly. which is like i don't know i can't think of anyone else who's, who's done that <laughs> yeah well i just sort of like figured out a few years ago that i could sort of um diversify do you know what i mean i thought i'm learning so much stuff here um promoting my own music and market, marketing and monetizing that without a label. Um, and I had so many mates that are in bands and friends of friends or whatever, or even people that I didn't know, but had just been watching the progress of Def Guitar Pop yeah. on social media or whatever, just hitting me up all the time for advice. And I'd always happily give that advice. Um, but yeah, something just clicked a few years ago because I'd given myself, um, so this is, so yeah, like five years ago was when I quit my day job. What was your day job? Uh, so I was decorating. Yeah. Um, but before that, I had a car valet in business that I started um, when my old band sort of bit the dust. We had a record well, what deal. What type of music was that? The old band was like, well, a bit like um, what you've said before about Ordinary Boys, because we all grew up together and was in the band for a long time. At one point, it was an emo band, there was yeah. a thrash band, then indie. But um, when we got signed, it was like indie pop. Well, that's what happened to us. Yeah, we were like, that was the first time we'd ever done that type of fucking music. I didn't even know anything about it. Yeah. I never heard the, ja- the jam. Well, that, that yeah, shit. it's interesting I'm, that, isn't it? Because you'd, you'd, you'd only been doing the mod thing for a short period of time, haven't you? And that was the thing that. I just... liked this. There was a band called The Explosion from America, um, from Philly. Or are they from Philly? Maybe they're from. Uh, Boston and they're from, maybe they're from Boston but they're like a punk band that were like a bit mod and they're from like two th- le- like maybe like late 90s early 2000s and they're amazing but they're an American band who kind of like did a bit of a mod thing and I was like I didn't know what mod was mm. so I was like oh and it looked like the explosion and then, I, and then like just all very very sort of like naively fell into all that yeah yeah well I, I listened uh, one of the podcasts you did I think it was the one with Pip and you were saying how when you were living in Philadelphia as like a teenager, there was loads of like punk kids that you were hanging out with yeah. that loved Oasis. Yes. And and at that point, Oasis had sort of passed you by. Yeah. There. It was and like you were you were if you were like a hardcore kid or a punk kid, and then you sort of liked the Smiths as a joke. Right. You were like, yeah, and I like the Smiths because it was sort of like camp and like yeah unexpected Some quirky things. And it just yeah. randomly, those hardcore kids were really into the Smiths. Yeah. And then what happens is you you like you listen to your hardcore records and you listen to your Smiths and then eventually you're just like oh the Smiths are like obviously way more like enjoyable to listen to and more like intricate and complicated and the mm. lyrics are, are, so that just sort of took over I feel like so maybe that's maybe it was like it was those two factors it was like the explosion and the way those bands those hardcore bands dressed I mean they were all Fred Perry's and like they just dressed like mod mod kids but they were like hardcore bands and then they listened to the Smiths. So something about those two, that scene and that music was just like, but they were all American. So yeah. they didn't understand it. It's interesting, isn't it? How like we romanticize over their pop culture that they yeah. probably take for granted and vice versa. Yeah. Especially music. Mm. Um, but 
I feel like so they yeah they they you know they're like oh, I love Britpop but they don't really know what but they they like know two Britpop bands and stuff yeah. and it's like doing this Rap Boy record that I've been working on I've really gone back into like listening to Britpop mm-hmm. and I'm like that's fucking there's such good music oh like, mate yeah. yeah the songs like fucking hell yeah I think my f- my favorite song of all time is still Bittersweet Symphony always will be. Um, but a lot of I think there's what, two drum and bass songs that are sampling that coming out this really week. yeah they don't they didn't realise they'd both done it with the main string hook yeah and I think yeah. one of them sings along to that I just someone's just told me about it but it's just funny it's kind of like quite cringe that, that someone <laughs> took the exact same idea well it's like I mean I feel like with the Britpop thing like enough time has passed now uh, it was so it was such a boom similar to the sort of uh, indie guitar music boom yeah. of where, uh, you know... Well, yeah, there was a bunch of shit bands time. there as well. There was, but I feel like, actually, because we've been quite deprived of um, good guitar music in, like, mainstream pop culture for a long while now, I look back at, like, the noughties indie and emo and pop punk and then the 90s Brit pop. There's actually like loads of fucking great bands yeah. that didn't give, get the credit that they deserved because it was loads like, of good female so fronted bands in in Britpop. Yeah, it was really good for, for for like girl singers. I feel like definitely. And then I'm like Naughties didn't have a single one. Can't think of one. Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess. Yeah, I'm trying to think who else. There was a band called Giant Drag. They were really cool, but they they were pretty underground. Um, but actually, the <clears throat> there's not that much good music. There's not many like. Um, canon bands from the 2000s like who's who's Arctic Monkeys Strokes yeah I mean they're they're the big two obviously Libertines um it just what it, I don't feel like it was a great time for, I don't feel like the music really? was that good but you were in it though I was I, I hadn't spoken to my guitarist for 50, over 15 years since the band broke up and he just works in tech now and he lives in Brighton and he's got yeah tea. and I um bumped into him uh, last week, like end of last week, I hadn't seen him in fifteen years, and we like had a few beers and like it was so nice to catch up with him. And he was just he doesn't listen, he doesn't play music, and he was just going, yeah, the music was quite shit though, wasn't it? About ordinary boys, and I was like, mm, yeah, it kind of was. Um, I feel like that's another like that in LA as well. It's like the one of the reasons why I'm, why. I love being in LA. It's because like the I feel like the history of what the Ordinary Boys was is so like ingrained on me here. Yeah, it's quite nice to be away from that and mm-hmm. do music because I can be more free. I can do the music I want to do. Yeah, yeah. Rather than sort of chained to like yeah that thing that you you like most famous. For. Yeah, or well, people if you know if you're like oh I want to do this R and B session, everyone's a bit like well why would you do R and B? But like mm. I can fucking do R and B. Yeah. Yeah, I think as well, though, like, you guys are definitely, you know, doing yourself a disservice there. I think we're all guilty as artists, like, to be quite um, disposable of our own like, yeah, back yeah, catalogue, yeah. aren't we? Do you know what I mean? I mean, if you think about bands like Kings of Leon and Killers and stuff, they all came out of that scene, didn't yeah. they? And they're, like, world-beating stadium yeah. bands, aren't they? Yeah, so, Killers are a good example of one. Yeah, like, yeah. They supported us. Really? Yeah, mm. and I saw the Arctic Monkeys support you yeah. in Sheffield. That's yeah. fucking bonkers, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I, I do feel like a lot of bands from both those guitar music boom eras um, that I that I grew up in, um, there's so much great music that just got kind of like shunned yeah. because we were Especially spoiled for Brit choice. Pop. Yeah. Bands like Denim and like, do you know Denim? Don't know that, like, no. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, good, lot of really good Britpop. There's a lot of really, really bad Britpop. Mm. But do you do you think there'll be there could ever be like another guitar music boom? Uh, do you think music is too fragmented now anyway that that it's like you might just get one song that blows up? But yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Everything has kind of become like little tribes and subcultures yeah. more than ever before, and I think that's to do with the way that everyone consumes their media now. Of course, because it's so bespoke. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we all woke up this morning, and we're going to be scrolling socials and all getting a different version yeah. of media, like that's kind of tailored to our, you know, our kind but of niche interest. Get... Whereas it, it never used to be like that. You, you know, back in the nineties, you'd wake up and all 
put the big breakfast on or whatever, yeah. do you know what I mean? And and buy the NME and, and yeah. fucking whatever else. And there was this bottleneck of media. Yeah. And I guess the... The, the closest like, we get to that is something like the submersible. What's that? The, this, the submarine. Uh, do you, do you, if you're not fucking right, the sub, you know sub, what that is? Uh, yeah, I only found out about it the other day. Oh my oh god, god. <laughs> I was just thought the whole world was watching. All right, but that, but that, okay, so it's like a news story where these like billionaires went down in a submersible. Oh, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah the Titanic, yeah, 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 of course, yeah, yeah, and then and something like that is something has to be that strange for everyone to to. To be like, all right, we're everyone. Everyone, look this way. Oh, sure, yes. I mean, world news is, yeah, but not yeah. even world news. I would, I would argue that the Ukraine situation doesn't do that because mm. some people are like, what? Oh, we what? War in Ukraine? Oh, boring. Mm-hmm. But something. It's like you, you still get those moments of that make you remember what it was like to all be looking in the same direction. Yes. Yeah. TV I mean, used to be like that. TV. Honestly, all the like Michael Barrymore just had to to be on TV in on, in the nineties in the evening, and mm-hmm. everyone was looking at it. Yeah, some it, someone dies on the standards, everyone's looking at it. Yeah, but it's so strange to ne- to all be looking in different directions. It's, uh, it's absolutely, really weird. yeah, and I'm not sure if. Um, yeah, I mean it, that that's the thing, really. It would have to be. Uh, perhaps, yeah. I don't know. Guitars are just out of trend um but but even like the the sort of the big radio one one songs and that of of the modern era do you know are are they as like universally known as no they'd like they're just sort of like Mm. like that they get like you have the occasional i I really like that miley cyrus flowers song i feel like that's like kind of will stick around for like that's really like yeah i also feel like in pop music like guitars are a little bit more like like Jonas Brothers and all that type of shit. Like, there's guitars kind of more in pop music in a way that's like, I guess maybe they always, I guess they always were. Robbie Williams had guitars and I don't know. Yeah, I, I just don't think, I don't think enough people would, would give a band a chance and be kind of like, even if a band was sort of had the, the beginnings of blowing up everyone's just looking somewhere else in the next five minutes so it's like yeah yeah I think there's just so much more like media to consume yeah. now for people Every, the, all, all music labels are saying like record labels are saying it's um, really really hard to break artists now mm-hmm. so um, to then that, and that's fucking pop artists that's anyone so yeah. then to put guitar bands in that I just think it's it's just tough out there at the moment. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it, I feel like it's an interesting one. I feel like there's never been a better opportunity for musicians to to find a fan base, cultivate them and, and, and make some money from that and make a living out of that. But it, there's never been a harder time in history to be like the next Oasis. Like yeah, so this, is, the, this is like, if you manage your expectations of your career, mm. and I see this a lot with people that I work with, because there's like... You can have like a one, two million mon- monthly listeners on Spotify. You can act like that's that's like a decent place to be, right? But yeah. no label is going to want to be there. Mm-hmm. They want to have you know fifty viral million, hits, right? yeah, yeah. Whatever, yeah. So if you and but and because they are chasing that, they panic and they change direction. They like fuck up projects, and then people end up with nothing. Yeah. Whereas if you were like, let's just do the music that we think is good. And see where it goes, and see and like just be confident in it. Then you would have a career that was profitable, mm. but everyone's just trying to break in a way that artists used to break. That doesn't really happen anymore. Yeah, it's interesting because you're probably going to get bands like um, Idols, for example. They're probably a band, a future Reading headliner, yeah, and Idols, but they'll they'll probably headline Reading having never had a top forty single, yeah. Um, there's also a kind of like with bands, with guitar bands, because people because of festivals, or get, so w- when festivals uh, like festival like especially Reading, there's almost a like you just stuck around for long enough to make your way up the the yeah. thing. So you have like Feeder mm-hmm. will like be a fucking headlining band at a festival. Yeah. When Feeder when they were in their peak were like 
not a big band. Mm. Not like, it's, Probably it's, six down from yeah. the top. Yeah. And then like the the sort of less relevant they get. I mean, I'm not having a go at feeder, like whatever. Like, that was just the first one that sprung to my head. But it's like the longer they are a band and the less relevant they are, the higher the higher they get on the bill. Mm. Yeah, I feel like people it's a good time to kind of be a legacy act in that respect, yeah. isn't it? Like I was watching at the weekend. Um, some of the Glastonbury coverage and Texas were on yeah, the pyramid stage and fucking slayed it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But I was thinking they've had to wait decades to have yeah. that moment. Do you know what I mean? The tunes have always been good enough and worthy yeah. enough of, of that. And people like to just be like, oh, I remember that. That's yeah, sort of like it's, nice it's nostalgia, thing isn't yeah. it, man? Yeah. 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 You, it's almost like you've got to like fucking stick it out and until you're at the point where people will like really lo love the nostalgia of it yeah. you know what i mean and i feel like people respect those bands like even if like um they're not like huge fans of the music bands like biffy clyro feeder yeah that have been around for a long time lifers like yeah. the cribs. I always think the cribs are lifers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, even if you're not like banging to their music, I think that there's a level of respect that you'll have yeah. for them. Just, just like you know, they're legendary. Yeah, I couldn't fucking do it. Definitely yeah. do it. So, so going back to the early days of Ordinary Boys, then um, once you were signed, how did it work financially for you guys in those early days? Like, I fucking have no idea. Can you not remember? So you I bought were you given a house. like an allowance or whatever, like to live on by the label. I bought a flat right away with advance money. Uh, don't know. Honestly, I have no idea. No idea. How old we are? Can you remember? Like maybe 18 or 19. Yeah. So you're just like a baby, aren't you? Yeah. At that point. I yeah. don't even know what to do. I, yeah. Like just, I've always been terrible with money. <laughs> I just spend it and then I'm, and then I make some more. I've never been, I'm not really like financially motivated in a way. Yeah. I don't think. Yeah. Well, that's like, that probably gives you an edge in this business. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That you're just, yeah. You don't feel like any, any sort I of I just do stuff I, I want to do as a writer. Yeah. Awesome, man. So did you have like a mentor or anything like a manager or? We had a manager. Uh, we actually had a manager who was my friend who I used to promote gig gigs with. And then we sort of thought maybe he wasn't, didn't have enough clout or whatever yeah. when we got signed, after we got signed. So I introduced him to this, these other guys that were, that had used to manage Cast and the Lars. And now they're still, they, they're all as like a three person company now. They manage like Michael Kawanuka and like the Kooks. And so, um, but yeah, they were, I mean, it's weird with management. I, I feel like it's sort of an unnecessary thing mm -hmm. if you're if you're a band. I, don't, I just don't, especially during. I mean, I guess you need to get a deal. I honestly think the way you're doing it is is perfect. I really like. Cheers, if man. I was doing it now, I'd rather do that than the route I think I'd gone. But I was not. Mm. Well, you know, like the, the thing is, whoever's watching this, your your um, you know, the people who want who are like checking in to get advice on on, uh, they're the people that will already like. I don't have that. Whatever you have to do the like emails and all that. I just don't have, I'd like fucking hate doing the emails mm. and stuff. But the people who are, list, who are listening to this or obviously already have that, that bit. And I think actually yeah. the music's fucking easy. Anyone can write a song. It's actually the, that other bit. And, and like anyone can write a song. You need luck and you, you also need some kind of like drive that that's the bit that's hard. The bit mm -hmm. that like pushes you through. Yeah. I feel like. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I feel like what's changed is, um, I don't know if it's, if this is like a, a fair observation, but it was almost like getting signed to like those big indie or major labels was a bit like getting a job, like obviously like the, the funnest job in the world. And, and I'm sure the work you were doing didn't really feel like a, a job. Do you know what I yeah. mean? I'm sure it was exhilarating and adrenaline fuel. But in terms of like the, the business structure of it, you're just being told where to be, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And what to do. And it, obviously it's it's kind of, it's on your terms because it's your art and your, your you know, you, you've constructed You just accept yourself. it. Yeah, you just... But you go like, with the flow and let people kind yeah. of be the boss. Um, whereas like the way we're doing it and the way that a lot of modern artists have been forced to do it is you've almost got to operate like a small business. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Be your own boss in that yeah. respect. But I used to fucking hate all the, all the um, 
admin and everything that come with it. And I used to, like in my old band, when we did stuff independently, I used to, perhaps it was just an entitled attitude I had, I don't know, but I used to resent having to pay for PR and things yeah. like that and feel like, oh, that's what the sort of, you know, the business dude yeah. should be doing. And then we haven't got those. Or radio way. pluggers. Oh, shit. Radio pluggers, stuff like that, where it's a, where it's like, what are you really doing? Mm. Like, it's such a strange job being a radio plugger. Cause yeah. You, it's not like the radio station, like the radio people listen to you more. Like they know you're getting paid to do it. Do you know mm. what I mean? Yeah. It's, um, I feel like, I mean, pre like social media ads and that, that was the only thing you could really do independently to, to have a go, like yeah. pay a, like a radio plugger or a press agent yeah. and everything and just hope for the best. Um, and yeah, unless they've got like a, unless they're really good and they're like well in with all the producers yeah. and stuff, it's a bit like pissing in the wind. You yeah. know what I mean? There was a few times in my old band where we paid like a couple of grand for a, a plug-in campaign and got like, you know, a fucking some local radio yeah. play and nothing more. Yeah. At least with like the social ads and that, um, that we do, you can hit the brakes on those at any point. Yeah. So you can put like say 10 pounds a day on yeah. a, a music video ad uh in our case that would target fans of like madness and the specials yeah. if that doesn't work for two days and it's getting no views yeah, no you engagement you just pause it and try yeah. again and not you've not committed to spending that full two thousand pounds yeah. you've budgeted for the marketing um cool man so um so the, the period of 2004 and 2005 saw the first two albums both hit the top 20 you were working really hard on the road building the live side then this mad opportunity came up and you end up appearing on national tv in celebrity big brother in january 06 um so i've been a fan since over the counter culture that come out when i was 17 um and i remember being blown away watching you guys at the v festival back in 2005 one of the things that was like really charming about that performance was you didn't have a horn section. And I remember Seaside, like everyone, uh, the mm. crowd doing a da da da. Yeah, that was that's a so fucking fun. great moment, yeah. Um, but during that time before the Big Brother appearance, uh, Big Brother appearance, it felt to me like you were still this pretty underground alternative band. And then becoming famous on that show just seemed to accelerate the band to the mainstream. Um, after Big Brother, Boys Will Be Boys got to it got re-released and went to number three yeah. um, in in the official singles charts, and your headline shows got bigger. Um, what I take from that is like how vital good marketing opportunities are for a musician's career. Yeah. And I know it wasn't purely a marketing exercise. You going on that show. Um, but Big Brother was a great form of marketing for the band by default, um, as loads of people were introduced to your music off the back of it. Um, I read online that The Ordinary Boys was one of the most searched keywords on Yahoo in 2006. Um, how significant do you feel Big Brother was for your music career? Uh, oh, yeah, it's everything, I think. I think, like, I think... We would, we would have been dropped pretty quickly after the second record. So, I mean, again, all of this, there was no planning to any of it. I just got a phone call from someone saying, do you want to do this TV show? I was like, hell yeah. So I just, there was no, I didn't think about it. I didn't think whether it would impact the band. I was just like, yeah, I'll do that. I mean, obviously, like, if some, you'd fucking would do it, right? Yeah, I feel really uncomfortable because I'm quite self conscious and, and introverted, but. But, like, if there's an I opportunity. I would just fucking do it because I'm If there's I an opportunity that, to do something mental yeah. and change your life, like, yeah, I'd like, do it. course, yeah. even like moving to LA, like, it doesn't really make sense for me to move to LA, but, like, I've got this fucking amazing house. I've got, like, all my friends here. My sister lives down the road, and, like, but then it just the sort of opportunity arose. I'm just like, oh, well, yeah, obviously I'm going to move to LA. Mm. And it was sort of that same thing of like, oh yeah, I mean obviously I'm going to do it, but like you know, it's almost like powerless to not do shit like that. Yeah, yeah. It just it feels like yeah, this is this could really open up doors. Do you know what I mean? And oh, I was just like, it'd be it'd be a good banter. That's literally yeah. the only thing I thought. I didn't really? think anything beyond <laughs> that. Yeah. 
Yeah, and um, he was in there with like Dennis Rodman, weren't you? Yeah, there, and started on Pete Dennis Burns. Burns. <laughs> yeah, started I made Rodman. I made really good friends with Pete Burns. I love Pete Burns. Wicked, he's an amazing guy. Yeah, but it did just sort of feel like things really blew up. Yeah, but that. I think the, the like in order to something to to tell you know the people listening is that, that you can like doing finding some mad fucking way to to like elevate yourself whatever that may be it mm. does, is is really good it's funny because a lot of a lot of the, the music industry has been so led by tiktok lately and i think now people are realizing that that doesn't actually translate into streams and also streams don't translate to to live shows so it's like no. and there's no money in streams so like really like none of that shit that everyone's worrying about really matters on a mm -hmm. kind of financial level except for record labels yeah. So if you're avoiding record labels, then you just need to completely change your focus. And like I've worked with a lot of people that have huge engagement on TikTok, and then they don't fucking stream. You put loads of money, or their or their first song will stream, you know, millions, and then the second one will stream half a million. Yeah. And the first one's fake, right? That's that's like you should just discount that. But because the second, because it's such a big drip, a big drop, they just give up rather than if they up been half a million on the first song mm. people have been like all right well we can do something with this do you know what i mean so it's like yeah um do you feel like that's because there's like a bit of a lack of a narrative around the artist do you know what i mean so there's this like but there is there is a narrative viral, in a way but are it, they are they are they presenting it in a way that's like keeping an audience engaged and like invested long term do you think like no i think they, they are doing that mm. but i think it's based on not on their music even right. if they're a musician yeah it's a bit like People on TikTok, you know, TikTok isn't, you're not listening, you're not like, you can't hear a song and you like people, you know, people will do the lyric videos of, with a bit of their, and it, it is affecting what music sounds like a mm. lot as well. There's so much of that music that's just like sort of little jokes, basically. Just yeah, like is it fair to say it's dumbing pop music down, do you think? Yeah, it's dumbing it down and it's making it, like I always thought the difference between American comedy and English comedy is like, if you watch Friends, which actually sucks. If you watch Friends now, it's shit. It's not funny at all. It's a shit. <laughs> like, my wife is going to be so pissed off with you. Saying that. <laughs> it's like a religion, Friends. <laughs> but if you if you would turn Friends on, you can watch any thirty second bit, and there's something funny. There's there's a joke of some sort right. to laugh at. If you watch The Office, the UK yeah. Office, you have to watch three episodes to really understand yeah. why it's funny. Yeah. Um, and I think that's how it's the friendsification of um, music where it's mm -hmm. like, no one's, no one's like, all right, I'm going to sit down with my headphones. I'm going to listen to this album. They're just like on TikTok, you need to have something for them every, that's going to, you know, they only pretty stay five seconds on your song. Yeah. So it is, it's dumbing it down. And again, I think like changing your, focus from like like in towards like live music like that like your model and just you just fucking can t just ignore all that bullshit yeah bit. definitely and actually like like do you have tiktok do you do tiktok and instagram yeah we're quite lazy on tiktok yeah though. yeah i don't think we've posted on there for a couple of months or something yeah you know I, mean? I mean you have to do like 50 a day to make it mm. work like i think as well that um one thing i learned was that you can't be you can it's good to be like omnipresent on on all the platforms but you can only if you f for me personally you can only really be effective on like one or two yeah do you know what i mean so yeah. for us it was like facebook's working really well it's a bit of an older crowd do you know what i mean yeah like, the same yeah good crowd for you for like scar yeah people that grew up going to madness yeah. and specials gigs and everything so uh, they're more like Facebook centric audience and that's worked really well for us. So we've just kind of put like 90% of our efforts into, into the Facebook thing and the content yeah. on there. And then Instagram sort of goes hand in hand with it. Um, and then, yeah, the music videos go on YouTube or whatever. Yeah. And then everything else is just kind of like, you know, we're there because there are people on there that will, that you know that will be into the band that want to engage on those platforms yeah. but even with spotify we've never really worked that you know um we we, we got quite lucky in that um i created a, a scar playlist on there and that seems to have blown up and we've put a lot of our own okay, songs yeah. in that playlist and we generate Smart. thousands of streams off that um 
that's yeah that's the only time we've ever really sort of done that's something smart. yeah it. yeah it worked out really well i guess one of the great things about being in like a niche genre is um there wasn't much competition for yeah. that do you know what i mean there wasn't many other like uh user generated playlists on spotify fan generated playlists yeah. So we we just managed to get in at the right time, and now it's got like twelve thousand monthly listeners or whatever. That's great. Um, but yeah, we've never sent our fan base over to Spotify apart from to create that playlist. So when we first yeah, well you also it, you're, you're you're selling records. You're literally selling yeah. vinyl. So it's like why would well that's the thing. Like, I think a lot of artists don't understand. Like they get so bogged down in the vanity metrics of like oh to look yeah. legit and to get taken seriously by agents or yeah. whatever like festival promoters. We've got to have X amount of monthly listeners. And there's certainly some truth in that. I mean, when we've pitched to booking agents, that's one thing they've said to us. They've said that your your Spotify numbers don't reflect like how successful the band is yeah. overall. Um, so. And yeah, promoters will look at that stuff. But if we'd have sent all the um, fans that we've generated from our marketing on like social media and everything, you even make no money. Yeah, if we'd have sent them over to Spotify, we'd have never been able to like turn this into like a legitimate, sustainable business yeah. that pays us both a wage and everything. Because you're sending all your data to Spotify. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And you're you're basically passing on these like for want of a better word, like uh, if you're going to break it down into clinical marketing terms, you're putting an ad out to like try and win customers. Yeah. Then you're sending your customers to, to Spotify someone else's business. and they become yeah. Spotify customers yeah. rather than your own. Whereas yeah. if you, if you, you know, offer them uh, what we tend to do is offer like a free plus shipping signed CD. So the, um, the fan just plays, pays the postage and the RRP of the record is free and they get something signed from us, do you know what I mean, at a discounted, heavily discounted rate, but then they're in our system, aren't yeah. they? Do you know what I mean? So that works much better. Um, but yeah, I've seen that a lot, like what you're talking about, artists that have got mad numbers on TikTok and Spotify, but no live fan base, yeah. do you know what I mean? No merch business or anything like that. So. Because uh, the labels don't care about that, yeah. really. They would, you know, it's nice to have your artists playing big shows but that's not the, that's not gonna make them any money mm. so i listened to your interview on um the boys in the band podcast oh yeah Everyone. and you mentioned how you're quite a shy and awkward person and you feel like preston is like a separate character uh, that allows you to adopt almost like a different persona um for when you're in the band so like, as a front man in a band myself with a nickname and a stage persona, I could certainly relate to what you were saying here. Um, do you think that many lead singers who are highly extroverted on stage are actually introverts that adopt an on-stage persona? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I don't know if I necessarily even really feel like that so much anymore. But Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think I was saying this to... The, the guitarist I bumped into, my old guitarist I hadn't seen in 15 years. And I was saying that, you know, he works in tech. And I was saying I felt like a little bit cursed by the fact that like, oh, because I've done the band, I like have to like, have like, I can never just like go and have like a normal job because you just sort of can't. And he was saying, oh, well, I think the reason that you have the drive to never have a normal job is the reason why you were the singer in the band. He sort of looked at it that way, and I was like, actually, that's probably more true. Mm. So I think maybe that's, yeah, I, I'm like, you just go in, in in and out of like being, you know, sometimes I feel really shy and awkward, and sometimes I'm like, feel super confident. But yeah. on stage, you have to be the confident version. So it's like, yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah, yeah, you've nailed it, I think. You've just got to learn to be, you've, you've got to learn to become comfortable that, you're not going to walk around 24 seven feeling as like fucking powerful as you do when you're performing. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. As confident as yeah, you do. Yeah. Think and you have to pull it, you have to do it then. You know, that it is, it's, you're performing. Yeah. It's a performance. You're, 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 you're entertaining people. Yeah, of course, man. That's yeah. Like, and in that environment as well, like you're so adrenalized, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And you're so like the fucking, you know, the, the, the music and the crowd and everything, of course it's going to bring that out yeah. of you and you're going to... And of course you feel confident because everyone's fucking staring at you. Well, yeah, like, yeah, it. that as well, yeah. Um, so your third record, How to Get Everything You Ever Wanted in 10 Easy Steps, was released in October 06. 
thought it was uh, called that. <laughs> <laughs> and it became your third consecutive top 20 album. Uh, you also scored three top 10 singles from that album. But despite all the mainstream success, uh, this was the last release before the band first split in 2008. Um, yeah, can you talk a bit about the third album period and why it all came to an end the first time? We all, we just sort of fell out before that. I think Big Brother was a bit like sort of, was a bit sort of decide, you know divisive. Um, In what way do you feel like the lads maybe like felt that it threatened the band's credibility that you'd become? Well, sort yeah, of and I think type? I, th I think this guy Will that I bumped into, he was just not feeling it. He just didn't want to do it anymore. He wanted to, <coughs> he wanted to work in tech. <clears throat> he was like, "What the fuck?" I'm... Like none of us really planned to do the band, um, and we'd kicked out our drummer and had a different drummer, and everyone just—it well, just was a bad vibe amongst the band. And then that album, I basically had to do it on my own. Um, so it was just like just a strange era, and I, I think we just knew it was sort of near the end, and then. Yeah, then I like got divorced and got married and divorced in a very short space of time. Um, and then I moved to Philadelphia for like straight away after that. So yeah, I, I can't really remember that era except for it just was sort of bad vibes. Mm. So it was a fucking whirlwind really, wasn't it? The whole yeah. thing. I wasn't really into it. How like, many years were Ordinary Boys together? Like since we got signed, like two? Yeah, we were only around for two years. That can't be true. No, three, because we, we toured for a year before the album came out. So, so you moved to Philly in 2008 yeah. after the band split to take some time off. Then you moved back to the UK with the initial intention of starting a solo career. Um, but the idea ended up evolving into a career as a songwriter. And the first song you write as part of this new venture is heart skips a beat. Well, that was going to be for me. I was going to do that as my as like a Preston record. Right. So that was like your kind of like opening gambit. Yeah. Like and then I was just like, I, and I sort of, I did test the water and I did a few, th I was just like, in fact, that, that record there, Just the Kill, I did. Um, that was later, actually. That was later on. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I just God, couldn't be bothered to be, I didn't want to go back in. Do you know what I mean? I was like, yeah. sort of managed to get away with it. And I just was like, oh, God, do I have to... And I, it, I was like, that's, I think that's the only way for me to make money. Mm -hmm. And it felt so, like... It felt so, like... Yeah, like, going back in is, is a, was exactly how I would describe it. I was just like, oh, fuck. And then, as a writer, it felt like I could still make music. Not that I was even... I'm not even, like, a, I just need to make music, man. I'm not even that kind of a guy, but, like... It, I just feel like it is something I'm good at. Um... So I was like, it's a way for me to make music and to still be, you know, in that kind of, in that industry without mm. having to, I, like, I didn't, if I had thought of doing it the way you're doing it, I think that's, that would have been really smart. And I, would, I think that would have been a really good route for me to do the band like that, if I could find people to do it. But at the time, I was just like, I really felt like I was just going to have to beg it out. And I just don't want to do. I just never want to have to like beg anything out. Do you, you know what I mean? Feel like you'd have to go around to labels and like pitch yourself and everything. And to and everyone. And, and like I feel like press and all that. You're just at the mercy of everyone's yeah. opinion. Yeah. Yeah, but if you're, you know, especially labels, and I've just and and also like, you know, the reason I've I started doing this new ordinary boys record, and the reason I don't want to do it, and I've just scrapped it. I've fucking got half a record. I oh, really. Yeah. Um, the reason that I've scrapped it is. No one fucking wants another Ordinary Boys record. No, I think that's bullshit. <laughs> the world doesn't need another Ordinary Boys record in 2023. Mate, there's definitely a core fan They didn't that really they need the, set, the album two or album three. <laughs> so I was like, you know, so I'm a bit like, I just don't feel like that I want to do, I just don't want to do it. I don't know. I, don't, I, I can't think why. It just doesn't feel, I don't feel, like I, I've been, it, the music's really good. I've really enjoyed making it. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of enough. Yeah. And I'm not gonna make any money from it, really. I don't think, unless I was, unless I did a whole like mm. th this route, which like it's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. it's a and lot you, of work. You've got a lot on already, and I'm writer. doing really well with yeah. what I'm doing. So it's like I also work. I've got this, um, potentially. I'm good, hopefully gonna find out today about this TV show that I've been pitching to Channel Four. 
but I may, maybe I shouldn't say anything about it, but I've basically been pitching this TV show and just waiting to find out on the finances. But I might be working on TV from now oh, on. Awesome. So, yeah. Sick. That's been... So it's more like... I, I like... I really like change in my in work. And, you know, you were saying about Roy Stride from um, Scouting for Girls. Mm -hmm. And he's still, he, you know, he does... He, he like plays all these corporate things, makes loads of money. And that's, I feel like that's a similar career mod. No, that, that's probably what I would be doing if I'd. Yeah. Uh, and I can't imagine singing like Boys We Boys now. Yeah. And, like. Your heart's not in it, would you say? It's like, yeah, that song is so, it's like so quintessentially like 2006. To, not just to me, but kind of, it just is. Because that, it, because it had such a moment then, I guess. So like to then try and like, bring it out, you know, to, to sort of like wheel it out in front of people. Just feels, it feels like begging it out to me. I don't know why. I, yeah, I, I can understand why it would feel like that. I think there are bands out there that are just happy to kind of like embrace the back catalogue and almost like sell the nostalgia. But if you're like, own. yeah, if you're the specials or, or if you're like an older... Like Madness um, or something. Madness. They're, they're the kings of it, really, it's, aren't they? But it's so, it's like bigger than an era mm. madness they're like they're so their music is like because it because it has an identity that is like based around other things other than time because it's so english it's yeah. so like there's just all these things um so i feel like they everyone wants like i want if i could i want to listen to madness right now Right, so it's mm. like it feels like always. It's just like fucking evergreen music. Yeah, they're a national treasure. Aren't they're they? a national yeah. treasure. That's yeah. exactly it. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I think. I mean, I guess the 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 interesting thing for people who listen to this is like that. It, it's funny that it seems might seem strange that like oh, I've got this like probably like a household name band still at this point. Yeah. And I'm just like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. And that's like something that can happen with. Yeah, but I mean, you've got so many other great ventures rolling in your life. Yeah, now. Do you know there's what just I mean? other stuff just... that like excites me now. Yeah, and I quite it's like the fact route. that it's that it's in the past. It makes it more fun. Mm. So um, yeah, just going back to to the um, heart skips a beat blowing up and going to number one. So that that was going to be a. Um, a solo record yeah. for yourself. Like, how how did you make the transition into becoming a songwriter? Like, was there did did you have like an in? Do you know what I mean? Did someone suggest, oh, if you don't want to do this solo, yeah, my be unique, so, these songs. Yeah, so be unique. Who was ordinary boys label? Yeah, um, they wanted to get into more publishing, and now I mean, they're the guy who signed my band is a multi, multi, multi millionaire from like. He owns some of the Ed Sheeran. He owns one of the, or they they publish um, one of Ed Sheeran's writers, and they own a lot of that catalog. And yeah. he's done like a lots of like catalog deals where he'll like sell the whole cat, be unique catalog, basically like stocks and shares, but with right. some catalog. It's like insane. He's so successful. This guy's an amazing guy, and um, he wanted to get into that career. So it was his. It was his transition from being a record label to being. A publisher, mm -hmm. although they had published a few, they published some um, No Doubt song, uh, and that was he like. Him, so they've always sort of was was sort of doing that, and then he wanted to do it, and I was just his kind of experiment. So he was like, "Oh, let's get you doing some. Let's try and do that and pitch you some songs and do that whole thing." So yeah, it was very much like again. It was like I didn't. Fucking, I just was like, "Where do I go there?" Like, do you know what I mean? I was like, I I didn't. All of it's been very passive. Um, so, and it actually, when I go to LA, that's the first, I'm going to like work so fucking hard in LA. We mm. really try and make it happen. Because all of it, I've like had all the things I've had in my life without really like focusing. Mm. And I, I do, I do think, oh, well, if I just worked really hard, 
then but you probably have worked really hard you know, I just think not that's felt true. like you have yeah. do you know what I mean because yeah, you've always that's done true. stuff that's like really stimulating and yeah. when it when it starts to wear thin and you lose interest you like lily pad hop to the next thing yeah. and and that's probably I would say um why you've had like a long standing successful music career yeah. because like you've you've either subconsciously or consciously like like developed the habit of yeah of that like once something starts to feel like you know you're you you're losing interest and you're you're not stimulated by it you just pull the plug on it yeah. and then find yourself like, you know, in another venture creatively with yeah. the music. And that's probably what keeps you fresh and keeps you motivated. And it, as a result, you always, you know, um, create your best work when you yeah. feel like that. Because isn't it insane how if something is like a passion project, the the amount of hours you put in yeah. and the work you'll do. Yeah. Even if, say if it's like, even even like I didn't actually do up this house, but like like I remember my old my first flat when I was when I just got signed. I was like so psyched to just do up the flat. It was my own first thing, and I did the floorboards, and I didn't realize that my hands were like sh- shredded yeah. and bleeding everywhere. And I was, it was like six in the morning, I've been just fucking doing these car- boards all night. Like, try and ask me to do something like that for anyone else. Yeah, ever. There's no yeah. chance. And it's the same with like. Even this TV stuff that I've been doing, like the hours that I'll do, that fucking endless zooms, the, the trying to pictures and all that, and like all songwriting. Mm-hmm. Like I've just done this camp in Brighton, like a dance music camp, and I couldn't. I fucking got on, get, got on the train, stayed in the hotel, and just worked for fucking all day and all night making music. Mm-hmm. And it was amazing. Yeah. And ask me to do any. Ask me to do. 10 minutes of like, like their train tickets, I can see that I've got to do a fucking invoice thing. <laughs> I've got all this money that I need to invoice for that I just like, and I'm just like, oh, yeah, making an invoice. No, thank you. Yeah, so it has to be stuff that really stimulates you. But when it is, you've got like an engine like no other. Yeah, but I feel like what you're doing, you sort of, everything is around that in a way. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Cause actually when I had my, I had a little car valet in business in Essex when my, um, previous band didn't work out and we split up after the, the deal not, um, working out, I sort of threw myself into that and was working crazy hours, like fucking seven days a week. But I actually learned that, you know, washing cars, I wasn't passionate about that. Yeah. But, but the business side, do you yeah. know what I mean? Like growing, growing something business, and all the yeah. creativity that goes into that. And I've never really seen like, you know, like a, a quite a normal like pedestrian business like that. I never really understood prior to that that it could be creative. Do you know what I mean? But, yeah, business is super creative. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got a publishing company and I've signed like these a couple of, of artists to that. And I, thought, I think it's quite Really? Like it, yeah. Do well, you have people that help you run that? I've got a business partner that I deal yeah. with. Um, and the artists are great and it is all really great, but it's a, there's, for some reason, that's not, that doesn't hit, hit, do the thing where I want to work on it. That's mm. a bit like, oh, do I have to talk about that? Can we just join? I, I'd imagine you probably get quite excited and put a lot of work in when you like um, want to sign an artist and, and bring them in yeah. that whole process. But once it's kind of yeah. time to do the admin and the hustle yeah. or whatever, that's probably where your partner comes in, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, he's he's like a, a um, producer and stuff. He's really he's, but yeah, he's he's. I mean, the, the idea with the, with the publishing thing is just to like make a publishing company, just get it sort of doing its own thing and then sort of check back in in 20 years and hopefully it's worth 10 million quid if you sell it. That'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, man. So just a couple more questions. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. So so on the uh, Distraction Pieces podcast that you recorded with Scroobius Pip a while back, you guys were talking about sustaining a music career. Uh, and how you take your career one year at a time and each year that you're able to earn a full-time living purely from music feels like a massive win. Um, I thought that was awesome and and that instantly made me feel better about like my own career, like listening yeah. to you guys agree on that. Um, can you talk a bit about where the mindset comes from for that? 
just like you I mean I guess the mindset for that is you just have to pause every now and again and go and, and go like I'm, I'm, I'm just fucking doing music and then making money mm. it's so there's something so kind of medieval about it that's what yeah. I love about it of being a performer mm. and like also I we would do this anyway right we would do mm. the we would do some sort of music even if you had to just play it in the pub yeah you'd still do it mm-hmm. so so it's sort of like being retired because you would do the shit anyway yeah yeah well I, I certainly like when my previous band uh split up i was like really burnt out and thought like fuck this do you know what i mean i've, I've failed at like a music career obviously you know not good enough and and had no fucking drive to do anything but then two months later like i found myself sat back at a guitar writing songs in this new madness style and yeah. I re- that's the moment i realized like fuck yeah even if no one's listening I, this is my passion you know what i mean yeah. this is something i have to do and um yeah like the early days of death of guitar pop paying out for like music video shoots and studio time and everything how i sort of justified it in my head and to the missus was like um you know there's guys that fucking spend a lot of money playing golf all year yeah. round or following Man United round Europe or whatever. Do you know what I mean? This is just something I have to do. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I have to have a creative output like this. So yeah, I think, um, like, yeah, like you say, you'd be doing it whether you're getting paid or not so yeah. to get paid. Do you know what I mean? And for it to like, you know, financially support you as a person. Um, yes. Yeah, you've got to have gratitude for that. Haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's just about gratitude. It's about mm. gratitude and, you know, that, that will, that feeds back to the music because then you're like, you know, you appreciate it more. Yeah. And you put, you know, then you put even more sort of, of that, like, digging deep kind of energy that you need to, you do. It, I mean, it is a lot of fucking work being mm-hmm. in a band. Even doing music, it's, it's quite fucking stressful. Yeah. So you have to pause every now and again and just go like... Yeah, I think I heard you say on another podcast, like the the songwriting gig that you're doing now, you'll like find yourself in a studio with someone you met half an hour ago and then suddenly you've got like pour your heart yeah. out. And yeah, you know, that's it can be quite heavy, can't yeah. it? Yeah, you know, I'm trying to do it. more just stuff with people that I know now because actually because that stuff is very stressful. Yeah. And I think now because I'm older, I want, I'm, I am, I'm sort of looking a little bit like what's the next kind of, what's the what's the stage above that because actually the older i get the less comfortable i am just like doing that that like speed dating of music yeah it's it's sort of a young man's game a little bit Mm -hmm. so what's been the highlight of your music career like i I guess it was an era but when we used to go on top of the pops all the time that's like I'm so happy that, like, even though that means nothing to people now, like, that's not, I mean, to our, like, my generation, our generation, but, like, kids don't even fucking know what that is. No. It's really, it's really hard to explain to young people what, how, how, what the enemy meant in the 90s, mm. or, like, what Top of the Pops is, or, like, even how it, music was before Spotify. Yeah. I can't even really remember. Mm. I remember there's, like, a Russell Brand stand up when he talks about not when you did, people didn't have phones. And he's like, you just have to go and be like, I'll meet you at like Woolworths at three. And if they weren't there, you literally just have to go home. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah. So weird. <laughs> but that actually to remember what the, what the world was really like in the 90s mm. is really weird. And so it's hard to imagine. I mean, I don't want to talk about the 90s now, but like I'm completely sidestep. Yeah, because but, of the top of the pops. Yeah, yeah. yeah but like, I mean, so it's hard meant. to imagine. Yeah. But for me, that was like. That's huge. Yeah. I, I felt that. So I can think of the feeling of being on there and it was like very just surreal and great yeah awesome yeah i remember like fucking when i was a kid we used to go around like you know um my mates houses or friends and family and i'd be straight to the cd rack and just like fucking yeah. geeking out over yeah. the cds and everything and yeah top of the pops um tf tfi friday yeah. big breakfast like all that kind of brit pop yeah um yeah, TV that I grew up with, it was it was huge, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean? and, I, and I remember as well in my household, my parents like educated me on like how important all that was. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they, like I, even though I was like, you know, I think I, when the Battle of Britpop happened, I was about nine years old. 
I think Park Life was the first album I bought actually, and and Blur and the Prodigy were like two bands that I was obsessed with. Yeah. Like, with posters on my wall and used to like fucking dress like Keith Flint and everything. Um, but yeah, like I just remember that time and, and Top of the Pops being such a huge deal. Yeah. So to be able to like live out that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. As a young it's like it, go on it, there and, and, and emulate your idols. That yeah. must have been incredible. It's interesting now when like people are like, like I work with people and they're like, I just had a number one. I was like, what does that even fucking mean? Anymore? Yeah. What does that really mean? It doesn't have the magnitude that it used to, does it? I no. mean, I think if like... You used to know what was number one every week. Yeah. Like, everyone would know. I couldn't tell you one number one single from this year. I mean, you know yeah. what I mean? And I work in music. Yeah. <laughs> but that's like what we were talking about earlier. Everything's become so like fragmented now, isn't it? Yeah, and, but like, it's also, that's not where I look. And, like, I'm not looking yeah. at who's number one. I'll look at who's on the front of the, like maybe New Music Friday on Spotify or some, something like that I yeah. might look at. Yeah, but I'm not looking at what is. I don't even know who fucking who does number one. Is that like a BBC, is that like a Radio One thing? Yeah, the official charts company of yeah. Radio One. Yeah, I mean, I look at the album charts a lot because what's quite cool about the album charts is it's like independent artists, guitar bands, alternative artists, like they're able to sort of mobilise their fan base now and make a statement and and get in the charts. So. That's quite cool. Yeah, you know what I mean, it's definitely helping like independent artists like myself like put ourselves on the map in in a certain way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, to, to help kick on and and yeah, build more buzz online and and get more bookings and everything. But yeah, it's certainly none of it holds the magnitude that it held like when we were growing up. So. Yeah. Um, but it's just different. It's not worse. It's just different. Yeah, so it's fine. Definitely. And we like. I, I love being nostalgic about. You know, yeah. I'm like. I'm a. Sometimes if I'm like, just feel, want, want a little pang of nostalgia, I will like Google discontinued snacks from the nineties, <laughs> and I'll just look at them. Yeah. And I'll just be like, oh, I remember them. I follow and I all just, those Instagram accounts of like nineties nostalgia. Yeah, I, I'm, right I love it. I'm very like, but I'm also very forward facing. I'm like a, a real both mm. i really like the future and i like you know like i like new music mm. and i like old music yeah it's it's i sort of yeah i because I, I, I have to follow new music for work it makes me more want to just listen to like tom waits and stuff yeah balance it out yeah <laughs> so what's been your biggest struggle as a musician i hate not having um just not knowing that I'm going to have a, an in, like a, like I don't know that next year I might just earn no money. Yeah. Right. So I don't like not, I don't like not knowing. I, I hate the not of the lack of security of it, but like mm. you also can't like not really hard never work and expect security. So, um, but so yeah, that's, with that's songwriting as well. You're not, I guess there's no kind of like, set recurring income ever is there do you well you have I mean? prs it's, and then and that's but even then i guess you don't do you, PRS know? Can do you know how much it's going to be no. before it hits and that's randomly thing, it yeah. could just be like nothing and yeah. randomly it could be massive mm. and then if my publishing deal is up actually in september so i'll get i'll sign a publishing deal sort of hope, hope i don't know when maybe the next six months do you get like demo fees and things like that for like writing like do you get a, do you get a fee for like writing a song and then the royalty on it, or you just, just get, get the royalty, royalty unless you produce it. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I get a session fee, but it's like two hundred fifty quid. Or yeah, yeah. So that's the most stressful thing about it, just not having that predictable income. Yeah, and I, I get so like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have predictable, predictable income? But it also would be so shit to have to start work at nine. Yeah, I just can't imagine it. <laughs> yeah. So I've just got one more question I want to ask you before we conclude. Um, and it's pretty open, pretty open one. And that's what's, what advice would you give an aspiring artist that's just getting started on their journey? Um, I, I mean, honestly, just like have a look at other career options. <laughs> <laughs> you're not the first artist, the first guest that said that, actually. <laughs> uh, because once you're locked in, you're locked in in a way. Yeah, because you just can't. You're addicted to it once you do it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it is an addiction, and it, it traps yeah. you. It's a, it's a, it's an abusive partner music. Um, uh, but if you really, I mean, also just make sure you're really fucking good, as well. Mm -hmm. And if you're not good, get good. 
Yeah. Because I taught at BIM for a little bit. This is years and years ago. You know, the, the like, t- teacher had to throw a TV out of windows, rock star school. <laughs> and um, I, this is a wanker thing to say, but I'll say it because it's true and it's important. But I felt like the most value I could have been in that job, even though I was doing songwriting, is to just get everyone to queue up and just go, no, no, maybe, no, yes, no. Like, you you need to make sure you're ready to go and put, commit to that. Yeah. So, and I'm not saying like, a lot of the, a lot of the people would be like, oh yeah, you're, you're not good enough to have a career in music to a lot of these people. You go and fucking work on it super hard, get singing lessons if you have to, like just make sure you're super ready for it because once you, once you fucking start putting shit out, then that's that starts to define the rest of your career mm-hmm. and def- define the rest of your music, the rest of your, like what your, your what your project sounds like and stuff. So yeah, um, and then yeah, again, what we said before, just like be mindful, be uh, uh, and be uh, like have gratitude and like pause, look at it as on as it happens because like it's really easy to just to not appreciate all the little bits that are so good about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, like, what you said about, um, you know, like, um, people not being good enough. I think that a lot of it isn't just down to, like, what someone's, like, natural, raw talent level is. I think it's... um, also like their personality yeah you know what i mean so yeah. you've you... it's a really it's like a horrible thing to say that but like it, it, there are some people that are cut out for it and have and that some people aren't yeah because i feel like there's so many artists i mean there's a famous clip of like ed sheeran being interviewed by jonathan ross and he's bigging him up and saying how amazing he is and that and he's like mate listen to this early demo and he plays it on his phone you know and it's really yeah, rough I I do you that. know what i mean yeah. and and I think that's something that's important. Like, obviously you get like some 18 year olds or whatever that are just fucking like the finished art yeah. musically and have got an incredible voice, write incredible songs and just very natural on stage. And yeah. they're the sort of early bloomers that are just ready from the start. Um, but then you have people that are fucking rough. Do you know what I mean? They're yeah. vocally a bit pitchy, songs aren't great and a bit all over the shop. But they've got something about them and, and you just know you can spot it in someone um, if they're going to be willing to put the work in yeah. to get as good as that 18-year-old that's just naturally yeah. got it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's important as well. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, look, Sam, thanks so much for your time today. You're brother. so welcome. I really enjoyed chat. that. Big yeah. love, mate. Thank nice you. One.